Welcome to Interviews with Innocence, a podcast about spirituality, consciousness, and exploring the wisdom our children bring into this world. I believe that our very young children are our greatest teachers. After all, they're the masters of living in the present moment, bubbling in unconditional love, enjoying the messiness of life, and curious about the universe in all its dimensions. The pure essence that young children exhibit lives within all of us. My hope is that these interviews will help us discover, embrace, and connect with the sacred core of childhood that resides within each of our hearts. I am your host, Marla Hughes. Today, I am super, super excited to have Karen Newell and Dr. Evan Alexander back on the show. Karen is an author and specialist in personal development with a diverse body of work that rests upon the foundation of heart-centered consciousness. As an innovator in the emergency field, emerging field of brainwave entrainment audio meditation, Karen empowers others in their journeys of self-discovery by demonstrating how to connect to inner guidance, achieve inspiration, improve wellness, and develop intuition. Dr. Eben Alexander was an academic neurosurgeon for over 25 years, including 15 years at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Children's Hospital, and Harvard Medical School in Boston. He experienced a transcendental near-death experience during a week-long coma from an inexplicable brain infection that completely transformed his worldview. A pioneering scientist and modern thought leader in the emerging science that acknowledges the primacy of consciousness in the universe, he is the author A Proof of Heaven, The Map of Heaven, and Living in a Mindful Universe. And the two together have um, founded Sacred Acoustics, which we're going to talk a little bit about that beautiful um, that beautiful program, I guess I'll call it music, um, later in the interview. So welcome to the program. Well, thank you, Marla. It's great to be here. I'll just point out one thing. I'm not a sure. co-founder of Sacred Acoustics. Yes. Oh, okay, so I, okay. In fact, I have no financial interest in Sacred Acoustics. That was okay. Karen and her business partner, Kevin Cossey. We'll just say you're you're a big supporter. I, oh, well, a I'm, big a, I'm an alpha <laughs> user. In fact, it exists because I told them these tones have to be available to the world. Yeah. They right. were just privately, and I said, no, 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 you got to get these things out there. So he's yeah. a catalyst, uh, but not a founder. Right. Yes, yes, even better. Well, I, I remember in an interview, Karen, you mentioned that, Evan, you listen a couple of hours a day many right. times, which is is beautiful. So we'll talk about that. Mm-hmm. So let's, um, we're going to talk about the IONS, International Association for Near-Death Studies, the talk that you, um, you gave at IONS. It's a beautiful talk, and I thought I had the title. It's Deep. Humanity's Pathway to Oneness. Thank you. Mm-hmm. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So Evan, let's start with you, your beginning as a neuroscientist, and your interest in cosmology and physics and how that helped you understand your experience and talk about that briefly too, please. Yes, well, I was very fortunate to grow up in a a family with a father who was a globally renowned academic neurosurgeon. And he obviously had a tremendous influence on me. Uh, In my teenage years, for example, I was fascinated with cosmology and physics, um, and then majored in chemistry and, of course, medical school, all of that. And it was always steeped in kind of the materialist, conventional materialist science. Uh, Now, that's combined with the fact that my father, who was very scientific and ran a neurosurgical training program, uh, was also quite spiritual. Uh, He had a strong belief in God and the power of prayer. For him, there was never any conflict. But like many who grew up in the 60s and 70s, uh, for me, I always knew science was a pathway to truth, but I made the mistake of thinking that science was headed up by this materialist conventional model of science. Uh, which, as concerns consciousness, it really is not. And that landscape is shifting dramatically. Uh, But anyway, I went through much of my life wanting to believe what I heard in that Methodist church in North Carolina. I went through more than 20 years in academic neurosurgery, questioning all of that because I couldn't see a way that uh, consciousness could survive the death of the brain and body. And that's when I went into coma back in 2008. 
And I would say to kind of set the stage for the transformation, uh, I would refer to a, a quote here from uh, one of my favorite neuroscientists, uh, John C. Eccles, who won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1963 for a lot of his work on the brain. And he said, I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism with its claim in promissory materialism to account eventually for all of the spiritual world in terms of patterns of neuronal activity. This belief must be classed as a superstition. We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world, as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. And essentially, John C. Eccles has just stated exactly the transformative power of my NDE for a neuroscientist. Right. Wow. Wow. So you talk about the bigger questions about consciousness, and we are so much more than physical. And I know you, you were just kind of chatting about that a little bit, but can you elaborate on that? Well, yeah, I think it's important to point out, you know, if, if um, we're addressing uh, consciousness, you know, what is this phenomenal experience that, that we uh, get from existing uh, and, and presume that it's just the emergent property of the chemical and, and electrical actions of the brain, what we find is the scientific evidence does not bear that out at all. That there are much deeper mysteries about this conscious awareness. And that's really where I, I would say that uh, near-death experiences uh, are kind of the tip of the spear. They are, they force, they're the jagged edges around uh, kind of our uh, ability to explain human experience where, uh, you know, basically conventional scientists have to say this can't be true. This NDE experience must be a hallucination or dream because we have no way of explaining uh, the reality of it. And yet the modern science and a lot of what we've done in Living in a Mindful Universe and other scientists that we work with around the world are doing today is really taking it to the next level by coming up with models uh, that actually do allow for this kind of continuity of consciousness. Um, and I think it's an important thing, especially because so much of today's polarization, uh, the political polarization, the economic polarization with the concentration of wealth in the, in the very top few uh, percent of the uh, corporate greed, addiction to fossil fuels, all of these kind of modern calamities are a result of this false sense of separation mm -hmm. and how we elect to treat each other. And what NDEs are really teaching us in a profound way, and especially the science of consciousness, as it relates to near-death and similar experiences and trying to explain them, uh, allows for a much richer model. Uh, that is really one of idealism, the notion that uh, ultimately the whole physical universe is emerging uh, from the physical layer of the universe. And I think that, that uh, this emerging science, uh, especially with its focus on oneness and kind of the shared consciousness uh, that we're all involved in, uh, will really help to radically change this world for the better. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something that, for example, I would say is pointed out in a beautiful book in terms of the effect on, say, religious interpretations of reality. Uh, and this book is called The Essence of Religions by Christopher Copps, C-O-P-P-E-S. And he's the, uh, one of the founders of IONS in the Netherlands. And he wrote a beautiful book where he used near-death experiences and their lessons over thousands of years from all different belief systems. You know, independent of uh, one's uh, uh, religion, you actually find a lot of uh, overlap and uh, convergence of, of the what happens in NDEs and what they indicate about the nature of reality. Uh, but in his book, he does a beautiful job of pointing out how the five major religions of the world could shift slightly, uh, focus more on the love, compassion, mercy, kindness that is so often found in near-death experiences and start to more fully reflect uh, the spiritual nature of our being. And that's where I think uh, uh, the NDEs and the science of consciousness, consciousness emerging from their study uh, creates a beautiful uh, kind of strengthening of science and spirituality. Uh, and really, this is about an unprecedented revolution that is unfolding. I would say a coalescence of more than 5,000 years of human history 
uh, and this coalescence involves religious systems as well as scientific and philosophical models. But it's all about coming into a deeper uh, truth and understanding, and that's where we come to realize uh, that oneness of mind and that power, healing force of love is something that in many ways is just built into the universe. We are truly sharing one eternal consciousness. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, so Karen, you talk a bit about that this isn't um, necessarily new, that it goes way back with Taoism and Hinduism and even um, the Greek times. So can you can you share that with us? Yeah, it's so interesting when Eben says a revolution is coming because that implies <laughs> that this is a new concept. And of course, that term new age is often spoken of to kind of talk, to kind of represent that idea, although it's used in many different ways. So I need to be careful there. But in truth, when Eben talks about this 5000 years of development towards this idea of oneness, well, about 5,000 years ago, many humans on Earth actually believed that we were all one. And that is reflected, as you said, through the Chinese uh, Taoism, which had a focus on harmonizing humans with the cosmos. And they considered the cosmos to be an organic process without beginning or end. All parts of the entire cosmos belo belong to one organic whole. That's within Taoism. And then in India, from thousands of years ago, you have the Vedic texts. And in there, it says, the truth is one. Sages name it variously. And Hindus actually believe the soul is permanent, which is really just another way of saying that consciousness is primary, which is how this, the modern Western scientific mind would say it. It's really the same thing. And where I think we really took a wrong turn around this concept of oneness was in Greek times. And there was uh, Pythagoras, a Greek philosopher from the 6th century BCE. He had ties to ancient Egypt. And the Stanford Encyclopedia, uh, it actually says that they, that they, in the encyclopedia, he is regarded as the master philosopher from whom the foundation of the Western world was derived. But we may have forgotten about that one concept that Pythagoras insisted on that is, uh, comes from actually Hermes in Egypt, also known as Thoth. But this concept is from one soul of the universe are all souls derived. And so it was really uh, uh, debates between Plato, who was on the side of kind of this oneness concept, and Aristotle, who was more of a materialist, who didn't believe mm -hmm. that the spiritual was real because he couldn't see it. And so these debates led to this idea of the dominant scientific worldview of reductive materialism that mm -hmm. Evan was just speaking about. And it's coming for full circle and near death experiencers are helping us learn that because they learn about oneness firsthand through their direct experiences as, as they hover between life and death. They're not in, you know, as they are removed from their physical body, they have this knowing and they think that truth is not what they thought it was when they come back to this world. But within conventional science, these near-death experiencers uh, are considered to be anomalies because they don't fit the standard model. And so they're mostly ignored, except there are groups of scientists from around the world who've developed new fields of study to address these anomalies, including the study of near-death experiencers. So this is often referred to as parapsychology or um, paranormal activities. And these frontier scientists have really risked their academic reputations. Mm -hmm. um, really for the past century, it started you know, back in England with the Society for Psychical Research and lots of controversy around that because these topics are not easy to study and very often fraud will be involved, for example, with mediumship. So as soon as you identify one fraudulent medium, it tends to cast doubt on all mediums. And yet nowadays, there's lots and lots of scientists studying this, these phenomena and finding that, oh yes, science is starting to prove that uh, there is, or maybe already has, we just haven't I'm been sure paying attention, <laughs> um, that there's more to our existence than just the physical world. And fortunately, 
1962, Thomas Kuhn wrote a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, and it's all about paradigm shifts. And he talks about how when enough anomalies arise that challenge the fundamentals of a dominant scientific paradigm, a new paradigm is demanded, one that's based on evidence and serves to resolve the anomalies. And so this is happening right now. Scientists have developed uh, ways to study and they have come up with a huge body of evidence uh, that demonstrates the reality of life beyond the physical. So it's not unusual, uh, as Kuhn will tell you, for tension to be created when scientists who are committed to the existing paradigm resist uh, new paradigms. And this is perfectly natural, uh, but it does seem to create a lot of tension, which I think we can see in our world yeah. today. <laughs> and Kuhn calls this a crisis point. And I would say that we are at such a crisis point. And when we're at a crisis point, when the dominant paradigm is being challenged so readily with a preponderance of evidence, one of three things can happen. First, the existing dominant paradigm can resolve the anomalies. And the way the existing dominant paradigm does that now is they call all of these types of experiences hallucinations. <laughs> Somehow they're not real. And there's a promise, this is referred to as promissory materialism, mm -hmm. that someday we will know how the brain produces these events. So that's one thing that can happen. The existing paradigm can resolve the anomalies, which has not happened except by kind of these, uh, you know, elusive promises. Now, mm -hmm. the second thing that could happen is the issue can continue to be ignored just by denying the evidence. And we see this happening all over the world today when certain scientists who are married to the current dominant paradigm, they just don't even read the evidence. They deny that it's even important because it, it doesn't fit their model. So that's really the, the solution that we see a lot going on today, which is really a non-solution. Now, the third thing that could happen is that a new paradigm is adopted that better explains the anomalies. And in this case, the, the paradigm that we're kind of addressing would acknowledge the spiritual realm and our connection to it as primarily spiritual beings, which Eccles did beautifully mm -hmm. in that yes. quote that Eben read just moments ago. So this mm -hmm. is not a new concept. It is not a new age type of way of thinking. And spirituality in this context, uh, what we mean by that is most simply defined take religion out of it, it's really just a feeling of connection to something greater and a sense of meaning and purpose to our existence. And these are things that are really lacking in our secular materialist world. We think that it's birth to death and nothing more and life just, you know, ends at that point. And so it really uh, challenges any sense of meaning and purpose in our lives with, with the thought that it just ends, you know, when we die and nothing else happens. But within a broader model of reality, idealism, and uh, even dualisms, one that at least acknowledges the existence of the spiritual realm, within a broader model of reality, the concept of spirit, it's no longer an illusion. And spiritual existence beyond the physical realm becomes part of our reality. And that is a reality that Evan and I live every day and we encounter others who do the same, much like yourself. Yes, yes. So when, when you, I don't know if you go to conference, you know, medical conferences anymore, but when you do, is it, is it even 50, 50, or is this still um, very much not, not appreciated? I would say, I don't know if I'd say it's 50, 50, but I yeah. would say the numbers are growing. For it's the not present. appreciated publicly anyway, but right. you have that great story. Yeah, I can, I can give you a perfect example. Uh, I was at a medical meeting, I think it was about three years ago, uh, and this was of, of, of hospice and palliative care workers. So, you know, more than 6,000 healthcare workers who were involved in end of life care. So they're definitely the population that's gonna see the most extraordinary experiences. And I was in a session, probably had about 400 uh, uh, participants in there. And it was all about uh, t uh, what they call terminal delusions. And it turns out that when elderly people are getting close to death and there's this 
kind of building delusion in them, it's a very difficult thing to manage. You can't simply over-sedate them. So it's a big issue of, from a practical sense. But the interesting thing to me was people were telling these stories, and I started realizing that many of the stories they were sharing, these are doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers, were not of, of terminal delusions, you know, that someone was seeing their departed mother there to welcome them over and had a very vivid and active interaction with that uh, apparent soul. Um, <coughs> those kind of things, especially when you have a long setting of dementia uh, leading to death, but then right before death, the patient kind of wakes up, comes mm -hmm. back to life, all of their uh, mental function seems to be intact, their memory, their communications with others, and you call that terminal lucidity or paradoxical lucidity. That's the term for it. And it's not uncommon. And it completely defies the simplistic materialist notion of brain creates consciousness. Because you can have terminal lucidity in somebody whose brain has already been halfway replaced with metastatic cancer, as an example, uh, who hasn't said a meaningful word or phrase uh, in months, and yet right before death they come back to life. And so I stood up um, at this meeting and said, well, you know, a lot of what you guys are talking about here is not terminal delusions as much as lucidity or paradox, luc uh, paradoxical lucidity right before death. And it's one of the strongest examples we have of the spiritual nature, the, uh, the fact that our uh, relationships with other souls is really the important currency of this discussion. Uh, and uh, in fact, when I mentioned that, other doctors started sharing their stories, acknowledging, yes, it appears that this is uh, more of an example of kind of this miraculous return of cognition yes. uh, in the face of overwhelming brain damage that disproves uh, all the notions of brain creates consciousness. So anyway, at you, that, kind of, you kind of validated and it opened the I door. validated. Yes, and it, yes. At the end of it, the guy who was leading the whole thing, who had grown up in a Buddhist family, it, admitted that, well, he'd always been taught by his parents that uh, some of the most important time of your life is right there at the end as you make your transition. And now he realized what that really meant. So wow. they all kind of came around to, oh my gosh, yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, we have a, need a bigger theater of operations to describe all this. Uh, and that's what I think is, is unfolding now. Yeah, not to mention the when hospice workers and and the kind of the palliative care um, people, how comforting then they can use that time to comfort the family. I mean, how comforting would that be to have a loved one passing and they their other deceased loved ones are coming to bring them in and just um, yeah, it's, wow, it's absolutely beautiful. In fact, I can say it happened with my mother. Uh, she passed at age ninety nine in April of 2019, uh, and Karen and I were giving talks on, on shared death experiences down at Shivananda in the Bahamas at that time, and mom went into an unresponsive state with an, a respiratory infection, spent the last four days of her life unresponsive like that, with one tiny exception, uh, and that tiny exception is that 2.30 in the morning, two nights before she passed, she woke up told her nurse, wake up, told her nurse, call my children, my mother is here, she's really here. When I heard that, I knew mom was very close to passing over. Yes. Because that, instead of being, oh, that's a hallucination, I realized that is an imprimatur that says this is an actual authentic experience, pay attention. Yes. And that's, it's one of the most common uh, kind of convergences of near-death experiences across all cultures, going back thousands of years, no matter what your belief system, encountering souls of departed loved ones. Before my coma, I would have promised you that was just what you, you see who you want to see on the way out. That's part of the reason I had such an extraordinary NDE in which I didn't see who I expected to see on my way out. If I had scripted my NDE, I would have seen my father, my adoptive father, the neurosurgeon, so important in my life, and yet he was nowhere to be found in my NDE. Uh, but I had that beautiful guardian angel, and I talk yes. about that, of course, a lot in, in Proof of Heaven. That And her importance was the identity of that guardian angel was revealed to me four months after my coma. And that's what proved the reality of the entire journey to me. Wow. And for my listeners, um, you can to, to hear um, Eben's NDE in 
well, you can go in a lot of places and listen, but I interviewed him before and we talked and he talked about it um, in depth, but wow. So getting back to, um, to your talk, I know you talk about consilience and to be honest, I had to look that up in the dictionary, even though, even though you did, you did um, define it during your talk, but can you just um, briefly talk about that, please? Absolutely. I think consilience is one of the most important concepts. It's one that's often used in science and philosophy and history. And basically the notion is that if you look at a particular big problem from really big different directions, uh, and you keep getting the same answer no matter what channel of inquiry you're pursuing, maybe you're on to something. And so consilience is that property of the convergence of information. And I would say that uh, in many ways, uh, consciousness is such a giant, giant question. Mainly, the only thing anyone has ever known is the inside of their own consciousness. That's how big and giant this is. And yet materialist scientists, some of them, will try and convince you there's no such thing as consciousness. It doesn't even exist uh, to try and dismantle the problem. But, you know, everything we've ever experienced, Karen and I talk about this in our books in uh, Living in a Mindful Universe, we call it the supreme illusion. And that is an acknowledgement that everything that you've ever experienced has always been a model within mind that we think is a faithful model of some external reality. But one of the deepest lessons of quantum physics is there is no objective uh, external physical reality that is independent of the observing mind. That's the important thing. Now in terms of consilience, what that means is we can look at this from the viewpoint, say, of neuroscience. And, and the hard problem of consciousness, which is something David Chalmers, an Australian philosopher, um, brought up uh, back in the mid-1990s in his book, The Conscious Mind. Uh, but in that, he makes it very clear that for materialism, consciousness appears to be an impossible problem. There's no way to connect the dots at all. And that is a very strong argument. And uh, um, I won't go into all the details of it right here and now, but I promise you that uh, that is the starting point where all this gets far more difficult. Then you've got another element of this consilience is within philosophy of mind. There's something known as the binding problem, which addresses the apparent unity of consciousness. That is, if I want to postulate as a neuroscientist that everything in my consciousness is occurring because of various neuronal populations, little neural networks all over my brain that are putting together all this kind of information, how is it that it is so unified? There is, it's not like you're referring to different parts of anything. It's all packaged as a complete package as it is. Um, and so that apparent unity of consciousness within an individual uh, is very challenging to any kind of materialist model of brain creates consciousness. Now then you can get into quantum physics. Uh, quantum physics is the most proven field in the history of science, reveals that at the very source level of physical reality, the subatomic quantum realm, we find evidence that the world we perceive around us does not exist independently of our conscious perceptions, perceptions of it. Uh, it's something that is called the measurement paradox within quantum physics. There are probably at least 16 uh, versions of interpretations, none of them agreed upon. and um, and, and they, they, they all kind of suggest something about the mind-brain relationship. But interestingly, I would say that uh, the more modern uh, emergence of quantum physical experiments uh, have really kind of pushed us into a corner of acknowledging, just as the founding fathers of quantum physics uh, generally uh, commented on, like uh, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, uh, Max Planck, um, Pascual Jordan, uh, Eugene Wigner, John von Neumann, they all had statements about how consciousness seemed to be fundamental in the universe. Uh, and the more modern emergence of that thinking, for example, if you go to the scientific journal Nature uh, in 2005, put in Richard Kahn Henry as a search term, you'll find a one-page essay he wrote in um, in Nature in 2005 about the mental universe, how this is not a material universe. And he was speaking as a physicist from Johns Hopkins University, very knowledgeable about quantum physics and where it was all headed. 
And of course, many other people have talked about this, uh, but the quantum, quantum physics in the current era is really getting to a point where objective idealism is the very best answer. For those specialists who want to follow that, I would recommend Carlo Rovelli's interpret, uh, relational interpretation of quantum physics combined with Bernardo Kastrup's metaphysics. That's Kastrup with a K. Bernardo is one of the endorsers of our book, Living in Mindful Universe. And you can follow that where, where it leads, but it's leading in the same direction, the primacy of consciousness. Finally, in this discussion of consilience, I would add all of the evidence from parapsychology. Mm -hmm. And it's really wrong to call it parapsychology or paranormal, because this is all about the natural world. Uh, and once you admit that consciousness is part of the natural world, then this gets very fascinating. But all the evidence for non-local consciousness includes evidence for telepathy, extrasensory perception, clairvoyance, remote viewing, out-of-body experiences, precognition and pre-sentiment, how we tend to know the future at least seconds to minutes in advance, uh, which can be demonstrated scientifically like through Daryl Bem and uh, Dean Radin's experiments. Uh, psychokinesis, the ability for mind to manipulate matter, uh, distance healing, power of prayer and healing, after-death communications, uh, end-of-life dreams and visions, near-death and shared-death experiences, and past-life memories in children, suggestive of a reincarnation. Not to mention the world of transpersonal psychology, which is taking those lessons of reincarnation and applying them to individual people's lives in the current era. All of this is the material that we discuss in Living in a Mindful Universe. Uh, other scientists have used similar discussions uh, trying to uh, point out this primacy of consciousness. These are all inexplicable anomalies from the perspective of materialism, but much more natural within dualisms, where dualism means you're admitting that physical world exists, but there's some mental world mm -hmm. running in parallel with it, or idealism where you start to acknowledge, as we argue in Living in a Mindful Universe, that the mental layer of the universe is what is dominates in the emergence of any apparent reality in the physical universe. So we, we see the brain serving as a filter for that primordial consciousness. And that's where it starts to make much more sense. Yes. Why, why do the two of you think that especially the materialists, but everyone, why, why people aren't more excited about this? I mean, this is like the most, well, obviously the most back. important Carly, thing. Carly, it goes way back. <laughs> think about, you know, Power? During the, think about the, during the Inquisition, when the, the church was killing people for, you know, talking about these kinds of things. Yes, um, yes. It goes way, way back. Right. And, it's so ingrained, I think you can speak to it a little yeah, more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, there there is a tremendous amount of evidence. It's not just not getting out to the mainstream media. Right. Uh, but a lot of people, of course, live this themselves. So uh, probably 60, 70 percent of people have had an after-death communication that was very convincing. A poll not too long ago showed that 74 percent of Americans believed in some form of an afterlife. And I think uh, those numbers are, are similarly uh, present in, in other uh, cultures around this world. Uh, people have had their own personal experiences that, that show them that the materialist model failed. So, but why uh, do the scientists hang on to it? I mean, because they're just so, they I grew think, up with it. It's well, hard to share. Yeah. A, a lot of uh, scientists have invested entire careers and written books and uh, you know, they have just uh, enormous energy invested in the materialist paradigm. And then to have somebody come out and say, well, you know, it's not true. Uh, they don't like that. The and it's normal of, to resist. The truth yes, of the it's matter. It's a crisis point. Yeah. But the truth of the <laughs> yeah. matter is moving forward with a scientific understanding of the mind-brain relationship and the nature of consciousness necessitates this bigger worldview. You can't get anywhere without it other than just denying the empirical evidence. And that's never been a very good model for scientists to pursue in terms of a deeper understanding of reality to deny the evidence. Uh, there's a beautiful quote from Carl Sagan. I can't really talk about uh, the exact words. I don't remember exactly what they were, but he basically said in science, suppression of knowledge is completely forbidden because we are not wise enough to know which pieces should be suppressed or not. 
Therefore, we need to pay attention to all the empirical data. And there are scientists who have taken these accounts, NDEs, shared death experiences, past life memories in children, taken them seriously, and then investigated them rigorously from a scientific perspective. And that knowledge base is growing tremendously. And to the scientists who pay attention to it, they start realizing, oh my gosh, it's an amazing, fascinating story. And in fact, I promise you, a uh, resolution of this conflict uh, uh, concerning our understanding of consciousness is absolutely essential to coming to an, any kind of an endpoint in understanding the mysteries of quantum physics because they're just right there at the core of the whole physical universe and our knowledge of it. Uh, and that's why answering those anomalies and coming up with uh, something that's a quantum-informed science of consciousness I think is crucial uh, to, to moving our way forward in this whole field. But over time, you know, Max Planck said that the only way science progresses is one funeral at a time. That is that the old proponents have to die off. Well, right, that's right. not necessarily true because I will tell you that the evidence that is there today, uh, for example, the evidence at BigelowInstitute.org, uh, all about the evidence for the afterlife from a scientific perspective, is so overwhelming that once people start to read it, learn it, study it, they realize where this is going. And it's not towards a materialist answer because that died 80 years ago, just that some of the scientists have not yet read the memo. Yes. Wow. Yes, I. when I ask, interestingly, when um, Bruce Grayson was on the show and I asked him that question also, why aren't people more excited about this? And he just kind of laughed and said, I was really happy being a materialist. <laughs> You know, it's what I knew, it's what I was, and and that that people, like you say, are just, I don't know, they change, change is hard, and it's so deeply rooted, but and, um, and definitely Bruce, changes. Bruce also tells a story, <laughs> I'll just, uh, he's yeah. he to a group where he, um, he was very excited when he first had his own sort of realization back in the 70s and 80s, and when he brought his excitement to the greater medical community, they just yawned. I mean, Raymond Moody went through the same thing and right. uh, Eben, the same thing. Lots of doctors, when they figure it out for themselves, are very excited. And I would say Bruce got a little disillusioned over time right. that, it, that that wasn't just going to be the ticket, you know, that it was going to take a lot more. Well, study. in fact, Bruce uh, basically had to leave a, a major academic yes. position because they told him they would not support that work. And if he kept pursuing it, he might as well find a job elsewhere. That's so fine. that's what he did. Yeah. Wow. So, but wow. But the well, good news is it's it's leading somewhere very positive, and I promise you, within I, I made this promise in 2018 that within 10 <laughs> years, no self-respecting, scientifically minded, intellectual, well-read person on Earth would deny the reality of the afterlife or of reincarnation based on empirical data alone. Uh, and I now would say it's, it's uh, going to come even quicker, I think, because wow. of that contest that Bigelow Institute ran. Uh, once scientists read those papers at BigelowInstitute.org, and they're available for free to all of the public, I encourage anybody, everybody to go read them, uh, you can't come away doubting the reality of the afterlife. It's crystal clear. It's there, written large in human experience. And just because we haven't been able to explain it completely from a theoretical standpoint doesn't mean it's not real. Uh, but this is very satisfying. I would say being a materialist might be satisfying for a while, but not if you're dealing with things like healing and health and becoming whole and right. uh, one's mission in the universe and uh, an understanding one's relationship with the universe. Wow. Uh, that demands a deeper knowledge, and that's where this uh, revolution in our understanding of consciousness is going. Ah, oh, that's so exciting. I love, I love promises. <laughs> Promissory idealism. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, that, that segues a little bit um, into talking about all the different um, prayer, distant healing, telepathy, all, all of the things that you just mentioned. Um, getting into the flow state, if you will, and what really sacred acoustics is, is about and 
some people, I think they feel like that they have to have a near death experience, but you have shown and many that you can go really deeply. And I have myself, um, by doing these other contemplative practices. So can you, um, Karen, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so it's important to point out, to kind of connect the dots that, you know, when Eben and other scientists talk about primordial consciousness or consciousness is fundamental, you know, what is that? It just sounds kind of esoteric. What is that? Very scientific. Yeah, and, and really what it is, is it's us. Remember, consciousness is our awareness of existing. And so our awareness of the meaning and purpose in our lives, our awareness of our connection to something greater is spirituality. So it can't be shown, right? It's all in our minds. And that's what we're so used to dismissing. We're so used to saying and anything that's our imagination or thoughts, emotions, it's not real because it can't be measured in the same way as physical matter. Uh, but it's our personal connection to that spiritual realm that can really put us in touch while the scientists are figuring out all the theories and the evidence yes. that supports it, right? We can actually experience it in our daily lives. And of course, near-death experiencers, that usually happens unbidden. They, they're not planning uh, on those kinds of experiences. Yes. And uh, many such spiritually transformative experiences are very spontaneous, but they can be cultivated. I personally have cultivated all kinds of amazing spiritual experiences. And our access to that spiritual realm is really through the mental realm. That, that's what we're more familiar with. That's our emotions, our thoughts, and everything else that occurs within our minds. Of course, we also have the subconscious and the unconscious and all of that. But it's our daily thoughts, the ego mind that, that we're used to thinking of as our awareness. Uh, but again, it's included in that awareness is things that aren't necessarily as conscious to us. And when we get into a more transcendental state, that means we're sort of rising above those daily thoughts and emotions and sort of uh, entering into what you just referred to as the flow state is a beautiful way to do it. Or you can call it the hypnagogic state, a deep meditative state. Uh, you could succeed in the same way through a hypnosis session, lucid dreaming, all of these things. I love how the movie um, Soul that Disney put out a couple years ago, they sort of split it into three zones. There's the physical realm and then there's the sort of spiritual realm where all of the uh, souls are going to interact. But in between, they call that the zone. Mm -hmm. And that's the in-between state, in between that sort of pure mental spiritual realm and the physical realm. And that's where the character who ends up going into the afterlife and having quite an adventure, he wants to come back to earth. And he's able to communicate via a man who is in a meditative state. And so this is what is just a beautiful example of how each of us can within our own awareness access something greater we can become more aware beyond our daily you know mental thoughts of a higher self a more expanded self uh, a self that understands more objectively about maybe why are we here and what is our purpose and when you can gain that broader awareness that broader perspective then it really changes how you interact in your daily life with all of the various uh, challenges that come our way. And those challenges seem to be increasing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, if, if you buy into this concept that we're all part of one consciousness, that includes all souls on Earth, all consciousness even beyond Earth, animals, plants, uh, all of that is part of one. But right now we'll focus on humanity. We are a part of all other minds in humanity. And so when one of us is suffering, really we're all suffering. And uh, we may not be as connected to it because we're in this individual body having this individual experience. But, uh, you know, empathic people uh, will tell you that they can feel the pain of others. And this is not that unusual. Um, so anytime anyone 
takes the time to quiet the mind, to release feelings of anxiety, release feelings of depression, uh, let go of past emotional traumas, really process through a lot of the experiences that pretty much every human on earth has been through. The more of us who can kind of find clarity within, the more the rest of us are also helped in this process of uh, the evolution of consciousness that is ongoing every single day, whether we realize it or not. So consciousness is kind of like the water that a fish swims in, right? We, we actually, we're part of it, we need it to survive, and yet uh, we're not necessarily as aware of it beyond our, you know, daily thoughts. And anyone who, um, especially with a Western mind, who tries the practice of meditation will often run into all of these thoughts just going on and on yes. and on and seeming uh, you know, streaming through our minds, you know, how can we possibly find that quiet space? Well, I was kind of uh, faced with that myself. And uh, when I would try to meditate, that's what would happen. And I thought, well, this is a waste of time. There's no quiet samadhi deep inside of me, uh, you know, deep <laughs> ecstatic experience waiting to come out. I thought I was just having conversations and, and things. But I, I persisted because I knew through many courses that I was taking the um, amazing benefits of meditation, not least of which is a strengthened immune system and, you know, makes a better physical life, but it also helps for a better mental life. It can help with uh, all kinds of mental issues, finding clarity, creativity. I really wanted to get more in touch with my intuitive abilities, and uh, so I persisted. And it's when I found a particular type of sound that I, I really turned a corner. And at first, it was sounds like tuning forks or crystal bowls, gongs or brass bowls. And uh, all of those sounds have a similar kind of monotonous quality, kind of this sort of wah, wah, wah sound, just that kind of puts you into this quieter mode. And when I listen to sounds like that, I found it was much easier to quiet the mind. And uh, of course, now I've come to realize that that quieting of the mind is really just a foundation for exploring well beyond uh, the here and now. And uh, eventually the type of sound that really I found to be most effective was something known as binaural beats. And uh, we mentioned that I founded a company, Sacred Acoustics, with someone named Kevin Cossey. He's a mechanical and electrical engineer who is also a self-taught audio engineer, although he did take some courses. Very much of it we invented together just through trial and error and our own personal interest in expanding our own ability to experience beyond the physical realm. And so these kinds of recordings are are best listened to using headphones. Um, and that's because we're delivering one signal to the other ear, a slightly different signal to the um, to each ear to create right. a wavering sound. Wah, wah, wah. So a binaural beat is actually what is being emitted from those crystal bowls and brass bowls, although it has many more overtones than ones that you can create using digital frequencies. But I wanted to give you an example of, uh, of what that sounds like. So I've created, it's a video, but when you listen, I invite you to close your eyes. And if you have headphones, earbuds, whatever you have that can give you that left-right differential signal, I invite you to find those headphones now and uh, listen using headphones. Okay. Bring your attention to this moment, here and now, calm and relaxed. Observe your breath 
as you inhale and exhale. As you breathe in, silently say, let. As you breathe out, silently say, go. Breathe in, let. Breathe out, go. It is said that the sound of Aum represents the primordial vibration that makes up everything in the universe, where one is all and all is one. your connection to all that is and let go.
return from your experience and remember. Remember your connection to all that is and have absolute trust that all is well. Okay, so that is from uh, the Sacred Acoustics Library, a disclaimer that if the audio quality may have suffered in the different generations of uh, recording that might take place. So please know that on sacredacoustics.com, there's a free 20 minute version of the same exact recording. So you can really get the power of it. And again, using headphones, there's a wide range of experiences and responses that people can have. Some people may have found an immediate sort of feeling of peace and kind of uh, relaxation. Others may have gotten so relaxed they fell asleep. Also not unusual because remember, we're trying to deliver signals that profoundly relax the body, but the mind is still aware and alert. And so this is so we can uh, get in touch with our own consciousness through asking questions from inner guidance or maybe you know setting intentions for things we'd like to see happen in our life this is how we do it we we develop techniques for going within and we like to use the sound but there's many many techniques this is just one way to cultivate personal experience really by whatever method whether it happens spontaneous or or we consciously cultivate it as each of us finds that spiritual connection, that knowing will bring us back to wholeness. And, uh, you know, children who know how to do this is going to really help our society as a whole. Imagine a world where all of us grow up already knowing how to connect with our inner world. Many of us don't become interested in this until we have a crisis in our life or in older age as we're maybe realizing that death is coming, we start to get a little curious about what might take place and getting in touch with that inner awareness, that consciousness, that primordial consciousness that connects us all really helps us to uh, come back to wholeness and becoming more whole is exactly humanity's pathway to oneness, both as individuals and collectively. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show today. This is just the implications. Well, what, what are the implications for humanity if everyone is, is doing this sort of work? Well, I would say that a tremendous amount of the challenges in our current world are from the false sense of separation that's inherent in materialist scientific thinking. And so as the scientific kind of model and understanding of reality shifts to one focusing much more on the primacy of consciousness and, and the mental layer of the universe and its potential influence, I think that's when humanity will truly grow into becoming worthy of the name Homo sapiens. Uh, yes. Sapiens means wisdom. And I would say much of what I see around this world today even though I, I might reflect on the successes of science and technology uh, in medicine and communications and transportation and what have you, I also have to look at the dark underbelly of what that scientific achievement has brought us in the form of corporate greed, addiction of fossil fuels, climate change, um, and so many other problems, warfare, conflict, uh, and so much of that will be relieved with a, a primary scientific and philosophical model of reality uh, from the scientific community that uh, that aligns with what individual people feel is correct, which I think is what we're seeing with this whole emerging model. And that's what will help bring us together. A quantum informed science of consciousness uh, uh, is inherently one that uh, is about unity and about connection uh, and how we're all in this together. 
It, 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 do, it doesn't mean, though, that we're not unique individuals right. within yes, that yes. unified whole. Well, that's, Very important. That's the beauty of it, is this individuality, but never to forget that we really are in so many ways in this together. So to hurt another is to hurt ourselves. And I think that's the most important And lesson. to hurt ourselves is to hurt another. Yeah, well, yeah. that's yes. true. Too. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important because I take that literally to heart. Yes. That whatever yes. is in my system is affecting other people. So that motivates me to clear my own stuff because it's one thing for my own stuff to be just affecting me. But when it's also affecting my, my child, my grandchild, my friends, my family, I want to, or people I'm standing next to in the grocery line, you know, I want to, I want to do what I can to help that whole be more pure. It's such a game changer. And I, speaking of living your life, I remember in our last interview, you talked about the research. It may have been through HeartMath, but the research about when you're feeling love and kindness and that energy and you're across the room for, from someone that it really filters throughout that, you know, through throughout the room or the other individuals. And just yeah, you're talking about up. the heart math research where the heart, yeah. each of us has an electric magnetic field yes. emanating from our hearts. Whatever emotions are in there, <clears throat> they're affecting the people around us as right, right. It, it expands and contracts. So yes. very useful to be aware of. Yeah. And that's a, it's, it's kind of like a, for me, a very useful hook into how we're really all connected because it, yes. it can be so strange to think about, well, gosh, I'm not reading that person's mind. How can I be part of them? Well, it's happening through the heart and there's no language right. there. It's a feeling state. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has just been such an honor. And where can um, I know you're not <laughs> I know you're not hard to find, and everyone knows you. But um, where can people find you and find out more about sacred acoustics and that sort of thing? Well, you can go to sacredacoustics.com. You'll find a free 20 minute download, other training videos, and lots and lots of information. A contact form if you have any questions. Just reach out, those contact forms are filtered through me, so I, I generally, I'm the one who answers them. And uh, you can also go to ebenalexander.com. And another website I would recommend is innersanctumcenter.com. This is where Evan and I have a free series of webinars that we interviewed people throughout the pandemic. And also it's a membership site for people who wanna join. We have a core program and we hold monthly live Q&A webinars. Oh, with wow. Them. And what's the name of that again? InnerSanctumCenter.com. We're, we're changing the name to something easier. But for now, that's a, <laughs> okay. It's, it's can reach us. But that, that domain will still work. We'll still point it to yes. the site right. when we make a change. And those interviews are really uh, oh. fantastic. I mean, there are a lot of the leader, global leaders in consciousness and the science of consciousness a lot of experiencers. I mean, it's a rich repertoire of experience, of uh, interviews, and they're there for free for everyone. And it helps people get on board with this uh, kind of revolution that we're talking about. And every single webinar ends where I lead a meditation, not using the sound, but where we actually feel our hearts. We go within, we feel a sense of gratitude, and then we imagine that gratitude expanding out from us to the entire mm. world. And so this is how we can help others in the world who are suffering. And that's going on in Ukraine right now. Um, other places all over the world need this sort of thing. We had a little habit where uh, we called it 11 a.m. love. And we still do it, although I don't, I don't limit myself to only 11 a.m. <laughs> whenever I uh, feel this sense of love, I imagine it going out to the world around me. And the critical piece is that those who are having a bad day, those who can't so readily generate these feelings of love, of which there are millions around the world today, uh, those people can simply open their hearts and receive that love. And so this is like a tsunami wave of love that we can send around the planet. It doesn't take words, but we can do it with feelings. And this is a way that we stay connected spiritually throughout the pandemic and uh, we can continue to forever, really. I would say with all the 
trauma and conflict in the world today, especially uh, you know issues in Europe with Ukraine and Russia, uh, and and COVID and the economic collapse of COVID and all of that. Uh, there's a lot of kind of grief and loss and bereavement, and this is a beautiful way of getting in touch with the universe in a very favorable fashion that can lead to a lot more kind of harmony, uh, acceptance, and uh, basically prosperity of the soul uh, in living these lives. And that's why we like sh sharing all this, especially in these tough and challenging times, to help this world get to a better place. We believe that peace and harmony uh, are certainly within reach. Uh, everyone just needs to get on board with uh, this particular revolution in the understanding of the nature of reality. Um, and it will lead to a tremendous uh, improvement in our human situation. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else you would like to, to say that, that I didn't get around to asking? I thought that was a pretty good closure there. I think it was good. <laughs> Okay. We can start talking again. Colonel. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And um, wow, wow, a lot to think about. So well, thank you for doing all of this to yeah. help people understand these concepts. And thanks for getting it out there. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Very good. Okay, well, have a wonderful day. And I hope to see you guys at one of the in-person conferences one of these days. All one right, of these Mara, days. One of these all days. Right. We'll okay. see you there. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening in today. If you want to learn more about the show, you can find us at interviewswithinnocence.com and on Facebook or Instagram at Interviews with Innocence. Please write me a message. Tell me what you liked and let me know what else you would like to hear. I would love to hear from you. And if you liked what you heard, please leave us an iTunes rating and review. It helps other listeners find the show. Thank you.